<laughs> Gossip. <clears throat> and, and, Sometimes well, so. Glad you, but we were talking about um, the Zen and the Zen stick and getting whacked and be here now and that kind of stuff. Yeah, you were saying that to remind to remind them to to come back to the here now, they'd get hit with a stick. Now, what I was saying is that so I'm 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 working on my never mind start uh, start again back to the breath. And that I find that I, I trying to trying to get better at that, um, at just that, at just the never mind. Where at first it comes with a lot of guilt, I think, or something approaching guilt, where you feel guilty for getting lost in your in your thought. And then when you get better at the never mind, it's more of a seamless never mind. Back to the breath, and there's no guilt associated with it and so or or less so i i feel like one of the things i'm dealing with a lot is um is is dealing with that moment of guilt and 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 that being something to to look past but also then i worry that i'm getting too um uh lax on myself or i i've just been feeling really uh, I, I enjoy my sits. They're good. I, was, I had a four hour sit the other day and it was good. And I rarely get bored. Um, I feel good the entire time. But then also if I get lost in thought now, I'm not very hard on myself. And so it's like, okay. And so well, that sounds should... like progress to me. Okay. <clears throat> Isn't the whole quality is, is to stop being hard on yourself? In that way, you can also stop being hard on your kids. Stop being hard on everybody. Take life yeah. easy. In fact, if you think about it like this, the thing that you want to be hard on is to make sure that you see when you're hard on yourself and so that you can stop it. You stop being hard on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> then I gotta work on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it does is it kind of neutralizes and tra changes it into a joke because that's the whole point, that this is a joke that, and, and, and it's a joke that you're that you're playing on yourself and you're the punchline and because you're the punchline you don't recognize that this is a joke you're playing on yourself so begin to teach it to to treat it like a joke become really hard on yourself about being hard on yourself you stop being hard on yourself <laughs> you stop it <laughs> And then everything melts into a happy laugh. Yeah. It's, so be on it's, guard it's, for that. And the desire is there. You're hard on yourself because you want something. The whole point is to train yourself into being content with the way things are right now. Mm -hmm. That in yeah. fact, um, that being hard on yourself, you also use the word guilt. This is all cultural remnants and hangovers from the Catholic Church's control over the Western mindset for hundreds of years. You either do it the way that, that some authority figure says do it, because your only option is, is to feel guilty for not doing it. And so guilt is a major part of the, of the uh, Catholic, Catholic teaching. But guilt is almost unknown in, the, in Asia. Yeah. It's not part of the yeah. culture. I feel like if, if Buddha would have come from the West, guilt would have been one of the fetters. 
<laughs> let me see. Let me think about that for a second. Okay. Um, or, um, that's actually quite complicated. You're 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 right. Uh, guilt also has the quality of of being a victim, of being victimized. In the sense that uh, the victim is the one who feels guilty. Um, an example of that would be a high school principal who will punish both of the kids who are fighting without actually coming to understand what's really going on. If the, if the principal would really care to find out what's going on, it may be, in fact, a bully with someone who's finally defending themselves and he needs to be congratulated rather than punished. And in fact, now the bully feels vindicated that, ha ha, you got punished the same way that I did. And so the kid who gets punished for standing up to himself and finally fighting back for the Buddha, now he's getting guilt. Mm -hmm. He's getting punished. He was wrong for doing the right thing. Yeah. So, um, in fact, that's what happens is, is that those who are in that one down position wind up being the one who's blamed for everything. Because the blame doesn't travel uphill very well, but blame travels downhill very easy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. by, by being blamed and feeling guilty, we somehow inside saying, no, there's something wrong with that, mm -hmm. that I'm not the problem here. The problem is now outside. And so we're left now with two qualities of this word called doubt. The doubt has two qualities to it, and both of them have to do with this quality of guilt that you're talking about. And that is, is that number one, who's responsible for this mess? Because if the authorities are saying the guilt goes downhill and I'm saying, oh, you know, I, I feel guilty, then maybe I'm the one who's to blame, but I don't really feel that way. And so I've got this doubt in there about whose responsibility is it anyway. But in the Dhamma, we come to understand, oh, yes, it, in fact, you cannot blame the authorities. You have to take everything on yourself, but you also cannot take the blame from the authorities and stop playing the blame game altogether. That's right, the first right. layer of doubt is, is that they are not to blame for my problems, that I am 100% to blame for all of my problems and that their blaming me is not my problem. My problem is, is that I, <laughs> I don't like being blamed, but the problem is I don't like it. So that's the first that's the first layer of doubt that has to be peeled away. The hell is my own damn fault. So goes the Margarita Bill song. <laughs> Some people say it was a woman to blame, but I know it was my own damn fault. You know that song? Yeah. Very yeah. Dama. Okay, so it's my own fault is what the second noble truth is all about. Greed, ill will, and delusion is always at home. The greed, the ill will, and the delusion is not out there someplace, but I can give you a good example of that with the Republican Party of how it operates right. in the following right. way. You have the very rich who are all greedy. They want more money and more money, and they want power, and they want control. So they give some money to the politicians, but the politicians don't want just money. They want votes. So in order to get the votes, they lie to their constituency. And how they lie to their constituency is not by telling them the truth. Oh, all of your problems are from the rich people that give me money. Your problems are from the others. Those that are not the same color, those that are different from you are immigrants. They're the trouble. In other words, the politicians teach the stupid minded people of America to hate the wrong folks for the wrong reasons. And there you have greed 
from the wealthy, ill will from the voters, and the true ignorance in the form of lies are coming from the politicians. And you put that mix together and you realize, oh no, the actual greed, ill will, and delusion was in the minds of each one of these three groups. Right. And so the greed, ill will, and delusion, then we have to bring it home. It's all my fault. Everything is my fault. But I need to stop looking at it from the situation of fault and say it, okay, well, if it's all my fault, then that means that the freedom is all mine. Right. I can come out of that crap. Now, that's the next question. That's the next issue of doubt. That's where the guilt becomes, um, let us say, capable of being managed to the point of eradication. Because when the guilt, when the uh, doubt is completely eliminated, so will the guilt. Mm. The doubt is eliminated when the full-on understanding is, I can do this, arises. I can come out of my own crap. I can be free. I can buck society. I can even buck Dharma for dollars and come out of that. And become free, free from the whole show. That's the real issue about the guilt. And the Buddha talks about it in the sense that this is, in fact, the very first step of the noble path. The very first knowledge. And that is stated this way. No matter how obstructed the mind is, I can clean it out and come to the, in this moment, to here now, I can come to the reality of this moment. Now, if you think about it, that's nothing but an attitude. That's just an attitude change. The first knowledge is a change in attitude from a whose fault is it kind of question into, oh, it's my fault, but can I do it? The answer is a resounding, yes, I can. And that's the first step of enlightenment to take on full responsibility and the can-do attitude to come out of it. This is stated in the first knowledge in Sutta number 48. And it's really, really strong. To, and, it, and in that regard, it's talking about the hindrances. But in this sense, the hindrances are all there. You could actually go so far as to call guilt one of the hindrances. And if it, and in fact, if it's, uh, it's, it may be even a combination, but it definitely has the issue of not liking. I do not like, but in this case, it's, I do not like me. Yeah. I, yeah. I line up yeah. with the authorities against me. <laughs> it's a, it's the acknowledging of it's your own fault, but, but then, but then not, not saying that's okay. You know, saying. I, I'm a son of a bitch, you know, <laughs> rather than saying it, it's my fault, but that's okay. I can, I can, I can, I can do better, you know, or. That's the second part of it. Exactly. Right. And I can come out of it. I am a son of a bitch. Isn't that funny? And every time I see that I'm a son of a bitch, I'm going to stop it right then. <laughs> because I have the power over that son of a bitch. A son of a bitch is nothing but just an old pattern, an old habit, an old bad habit. Yeah. And when it arises, I'm going to watch for it. I'm going to grab it by the throat and pull it right out of the mind. That's that attitude, that can-do attitude, that first step of soda pot. Yeah. That can do attitude. That's the very first thing. So if that's the first step of enlightenment, that means it's important for the meditation teachers to make sure that the students understand that they have to go through this attitude change. They were actually practicing the Eightfold Noble Path in the sense of right um, view leading to right attitude based upon to remember to do that often with right sati using right effort, 
So even before we even need to know about the Eightfold Noble Path, we're still practicing the Eightfold Noble Path right from the very beginning. Um, Leading to that find, first step. I'm finding with the uh, with the noting that that the noting um, it. Uh, it's so there's there's just so much going on that all I can do is just try to get farther and farther away from it or or, or something like that that it's uh that I'm no that I can notice it all um, but trying to note it all doesn't make any sense at some point it seems like some point I'm just I'm noticing it all at the same time, and I'm not really. In that regard, is obviously grandiose. Yeah. There is so much happening in this present moment. You could not, as a human being, possibly, even if you could register it all, getting all into the brain, let alone processing it. No possibility of processing all of it. That's the whole point, is to recognize that you're actually the here now of the Dhamma. The environment that you're in will overwhelm your senses when you start paying attention to the senses. They will be overwhelmed with data, flooded with data, flooded with every little neuron on the um, every hair follicle. All of that has uh, a sensory input. And so we really become deeply connected with the with the environment or the the greater Dhamma. We become at one with it. Literally where the rubber meets the road in the sense of where the skin meets the air. Or the butt <laughs> meets the chair. <laughs> <laughs> or the foot meets the floor. Uh, I tried an hour of uh, hard determination sitting. I don't know why I did it. <clears throat> it was about an hour and a half, and my it, toward the end of it, it was excruciating. I don't know. I don't know how to get past that. My leg fell asleep, and it was just excruciating pain. I just couldn't deal with it anymore. What but, did you do? Um. Well, I set for an hour and a half without moving just uh it's it's no, called I mean, strong... when the pain when the pain came when the pain came of... yeah when the pain came um i would i i would vacillate between uh trying to pay very close attention to it and then trying to get very far away from it you know i would try to sort of go into the pain and and pay attention to uh pay attention to it like i've done in the past with certain sort of fears or s that i've been able to pay attention to the to the feeling of the fear and, and it sort of dissipate uh, but this was so strong and it la and it just kept going and getting stronger and stronger um that i couldn't wrap my mind around it i couldn't and so I'd try to, I could get some distance from it, and I could tell that there were parts of my mind that were completely unaffected by it. And But I couldn't just escape completely into that, you know, that, uh, I, I don't know. Um, All right, the analogy that I would use here would be the analogy of a sportsman or one who is um, in training for a sport trying to do too much mm -hmm. like a gymnast who can do maybe one turn is now trying to do two uh there is a long list and i know of i can name you names of folks who have come to the place where they can't sit anymore because they damaged their legs mm -hmm. So they were not paying attention to the pain in their legs. And now when they sit, the legs will start to scream and scream. No, 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 no. 
And um, it happens with monks. Please don't let it happen to you. That I do not recommend strong determination sittings that are of long duration saying, okay, I'm going to do, I, I, <laughs> I barely crawled across the floor in my life, but today I'm going to run a marathon. That's the mm -hmm. mentality. Okay, stop that. If you're going to go for long, strong determination sittings, build them up. Mm -hmm. So that you do not spend a lot of time in that pain state. That as long as your mind can manage it, that's the point. That's the training. Once the pain becomes too much for the mind to manage, it is absolutely stupid to sit there letting the legs themselves rot and deteriorate, causing bone damage, muscle damage, all kinds of stuff that can happen. I know that monks, uh, many monks, have trouble walking because they've been sitting too long. Yeah. So don't do that. That's this is not an endurance contest. There's no value in strong determination sittings other than the following. I can think of two reasons why I would want to teach students how to do strong determination sittings. One would be CIA agents who are training so that they can manage getting captured and tortured. That would be very handy for the CIA to have people that are actually capable of being, you know, uh, tortured. And then they find it reveal the lies <laughs> so that, you know, they can actually infiltrate. Oh, well, we got this data because it was from, uh, <laughs> you know, we really tortured this guy. And he finally gave up the ghost or kind of gave up the ghost. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that would be one group. I want to train CIA agents so that they can manage getting waterboarded, so that they can manage getting tortured. Mm -hmm. The other group are those Jesus freaks who want to hang out on the cross. <laughs> but then I want to teach them to keep breathing, keep breathing, take that next breath, keep breathing. <laughs> keep doing it keep alive stay up there <laughs> you know but I mean, unless you're going to intentionally cru get yourself crucified and i don't know of any pontius pilots around to apply to <laughs> those days are over cia would be the only ones that i would reserve strong determination sittings for all of the other monks and, and lay people who try that kind of stuff wind up giving themselves physical damage very similar to the way that some athletes like uh, an example would be in china they were training little girls from young childhood to be gymnast and then they would win a gold medal by the time they were 13 to 16 and then they were crippled from the time of 25. yeah yeah don't do that to the body yeah, I, I I decided after I'd done it that it really didn't do anything for me above and beyond a typical sit. It just, I felt, I was just in excrete. If anything, it was a worse You felt guilty for giving to... into the pain. You felt guilty for giving into the pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can't avoid it. It's strong. To t how can you have strong determination without guilt i don't you know how can i be determined and give up okay. on something yeah. be, be determined to not be guilty okay be determined for the right thing <laughs> be determined to be here now mm -hmm. but in fact that's a very important word determined determination it is in fact one of the most important qualities to become the full fruit of soda pot is that when we get so deep into the four noble truths we get so deep into understanding the nature of suffering and what it's like we become determined to put an end to it and in your case you become determined to put an end to that guilt and so you're going to be on guard for it. And anytime guilt comes up, you can take a deep breath. 
I call you, Mr. Guilt. Out, get out. No room for guilt here. This is only room for the champions. No victims allowed. And so you have to remember that. Be determined to be on guard for the guilt. Be determined to be on guard for any kind of these feelings. An example would be restlessness. That in fact, I could see that guilt would be mixed with restlessness because guilt gives us the feeling we got to do something. We got to fix what I broke. We've now got a job to do. The, the, the announcement of the failure was also inbuilt the announcement to do. It was a call to action. The announcement of the failure is also a call to action. What is that called? It's that guilt. It's got to, it, we got something to do now. And so what we're wanting as a, uh, to change that determination is to be determined to see that point in time when the mind wants to deliver the message, something's wrong. Something's broken because there's nothing broken. There's nothing wrong. If, if, you're, if the legs are hurt, move the leg. The, move, the leg was probably going to move by itself anyway if you hadn't have forced it to stay still. You would have moved on its own. If the reptilian brain had had a chance, he would have he would have gotten up out of the meditation and taken a hike. <laughs> Which reminds me of the story that's called Refrigerator Door. You know the meditator's refrigerator door story? Meditator yeah, sitting yeah. there in, in great bliss. He's taking an in breath and he's taking an out breath. And the next thing you, he wakes up and he says, wait a minute. Why am I standing in front of the refrigerator with the door open? How did I get off of my meditation cushion that I was happily in bliss and get all the way into the kitchen to open the refrigerator door before I finally woke up? <laughs> that's, that's something to feel guilty over. <laughs> to be that mindless for that long. <laughs> but it happens. Yeah. Does happen, not to everyone, but you can see how the mind can get lost. Even for very good meditators, we can get off on something. We can have a run in with someone and then the mind will just spin and spin and spin. Now in the old days, it might spin with hatred, but knew now that the, he's a Dhamma dude is going to spin with how can I fix this? But it's still based in wanting something. Mm. Rather than just, just let it go. It's okay. No problem. That's yeah. very Asian. But in fact, it leads to the issue of the distinction between conflict resolution and conflict avoidance. Within the Thai community, as part of the community in Thailand, that people avoid conflict. Where the whole Western society is built upon conflict resolution. If there's a problem, we got to fix it. The Buddha was kind of halfway in between there in the sense that there was solutions to problems. There was the paddy mark. There was the whole issue of friendliness and that things should be covered over with leaves. In other words, if two people have an argument or they've got a problem with, to get, uh, with each other, then let's take that problem and set it over there someplace and cover it over with leaves. In other words, we ignore it. And now we can be friends in all other cases. To where conflict avoidance means that not only do we avoid the conflict, we actually avoid each other. But that issue between us will always be there. Can we, in fact, take that issue, set it aside, cover it with leaves, and be friends otherwise? The Western way to do it is, oh, no, we've got to come back into conflict again in order to resolve this conflict, which basically means you have this bang, 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 bang sometimes, but nothing ever gets resolved. Yeah. Yeah, and then people end up feeling like they can't, they can't even talk to each other until 
whatever it is is resolved, even even if it's not resolvable. Even right, because people generally don't change their attitudes. And this is a good reason for it. That's why they do Dhamma is so that they can learn how to change their attitude. Otherwise, people are not going to change their attitudes much. <laughs> so if there's two Dhamma dudes, maybe one of them or the other one, we can hear, oh, yeah, I, all I have to do is change the attitude. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Let's just go ahead and be friends. That's the right way to go. But in the West or even in Thailand, um, Basically, what will happen if this is if the conflict is within the family, then the old matriarchs, the old women will come in and set the story straight. The women, this is actually Thailand as a as a matriarchal society. Mm. And I think that the Buddha had a lot to do with that, because in one of the suttas, it recommends that uh, the lay followers of the Buddha should hand all of the authority of the household over to the wife. And because of that, with it, at least in the household here, and I, I do I do that too. I I uh, um, give control of the house over to to Tam. That mm -hmm. that last night I had to to go run an errand, and she says, "You don't go. I'll send." uh her her nephew and i mm -hmm. said oh no i'll do it myself and <laughs> then i got the reaction i said no no you do it your way <laughs> if you <laughs> if you want uh uh boom to go run that errand then he'll go run that errand i'm going to sit here and do what i'm told to do <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> that would probably solve a lot of my problems if i had that attitude yeah, exactly. Let <laughs> if the wife I embrace have... that attitude, it, it's it's already kind of that way. I just haven't embraced it. You have to remember, because the old habit is, oh, I'm the man, I'm in charge, I said I would do it, I've got to do it, right? Responsibility. Mm -hmm. I said I would do it, i got to do it. But the uh, things are different. With a with a matriarchal society, so in mm. fact, that's a good idea. Yeah, give your wife the authority for everything. The more authority you give her, the less she'll have to do in your whole life. And the, and when I mean by more, I mean the more often you do it. Yeah. Just get into the habit of it by practicing over and over again. This is another point of mindfulness to be on guard for. So instead of now being on guard for just um, guilt, you can also be on guard for making sure that you do what your wife tells you to do. Yeah, um, I, I get I get more practice with my family, my kid, my wife, and than I do on the cushion for sure. <clears throat> I'm really trying to embrace that. <laughs> the never mind, never mind, start again. Especially when you're in the heat of a, an argument. That's, that's really blown her mind a couple of times. She, she can't really come to the terms with uh, when, when we're in the heat of an argument. And I just stop, you know. I just disengage with the argument. Not Can you disengage it. with the words you're right? I should shut my mouth. I, I've done that once <laughs> it hurt but she, it was well received by her yeah, yeah. and it, it was well received by me it was you know <laughs> it was all it was better <clears throat> that's that's definitely you know trying to uh be a householder, you know, in a household where you're the only one trying on, on this Dhamma path, you know. I can see the effects that it has on my wife, so, you know. Um, even though she's not anywhere near buying into it herself, you know. Your, your Dhamma, your Dhamma practice should be of value and benefit to everyone. Yeah. 
because you change your ways of doing things, you change your attitude. That basically you change your attitude from the ways your dad did it into the ways that you know are correct. And all you have to do is remember. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, well, let's finish this. I've got a couple of other people who have been sure. sending messages, yeah. and so yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's finish this up with that quality of paying forward again. Okay. That the, that the Dhamma is to be freely given. It's too valuable to charge money for, and if you take it to the marketplace, it, it picks up the dust from the marketplace that it should be freely given. And so uh, almost freely given in the sense of uh, providing not just the Dhamma teaching itself, but the entire environment. So mm -hmm. that if you go to a temple, you go to a Wat, you go to anything like that in Asia, you'll be openly received, just like you're talking about with that place. Um, and we need more of those. And so it would be very valuable for uh, the general population of America or the world in general, um, speaking English, to begin to understand that the Dhamma should be given freely, that it gets polluted by money. Yeah. And if you can start that as an idea, I'm sure that's enough people that have come from the email that I've sent out will come to your support. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm 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 gonna give it some thought and uh and uh yeah. <clears throat> you can take oh, some of the know, stuff that I've sent in the in the email and pull it apart okay. and make it yeah. your own. Yeah. The ideas I'm, are already there. Yep. All right, cool. Eric. Well we'll see you later. Thanks, Tomorado. Talk to you. Give later. all of your yeah, give all of your authority over to your wife. I'll try. Let her out. be the boss. She'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.